hello everyone. I uh, hope you're all doing well. I'm very happy to be here uh, today with you. Uh, so as you can see from the slide, I'm the, uh, the title of the, pro of the presentation is At What Points in the Research Lifecycle Can an Arts Library Facilitate Visual Arts Research? And that I'm the teaching and research librarian, uh, teaching and research librarian for the Fine Arts at Concordia University. So in addition to being a librarian, I'm also a uh, practicing visual artist. I've given my contact information here and I'll give it again on the last slide in case you have any questions for me after today. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to mention that I have a solo exhibition in London that's coming up. Uh, I don't know if I can promote it or not, but yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, from July 14th to the 22nd and it's at a co cooperative artist gallery called Five Years. So it's July 14th to the 22nd and uh, I'll give a link to the website uh, at the end of my presentation. And uh, hopefully if you get a chance, uh, please uh, drop in. I'll be there for the two weeks. So, great. So we'll uh, get to start. Here we go. So uh, I've uh, structured my presentation uh, into four sections. So in the first section, I'll talk about uh, the presentation question and then I'll try and propose an answer for it. And then I'll talk a little bit about the context. I'll be talking about art text, a place that I worked at years ago, um, as well as the research residency program. I'll also talk about a research res my own particular research residency, which was called, or which is called, Who is Who was Who in Contemporary Canadian Art, and it's an ongoing project. I'll then talk about uh, research lifecycle for the visual arts. I'll try and propose one. And then in the third section, I'll try and map uh, the support that I received, the research report support that I received from Art Text uh, uh, with my own project. And then at the end, I'll talk about, uh, I'll try and provide a summary with some of the broader implications. Okay, so we'll just start with the uh, presentation question and uh, proposed answer. So as you know, the question is, at what points in the research lifecycle can an arts library facilitate visual arts research? And as an answer, I've tried to come up with this through the use of concrete examples from an ongoing research project that was initiated during a residency at Art Text. I hope to show that an arts library can facilitate visual arts research throughout the entire research life cycle in numerous and invaluable ways. Okay, so we'll start uh, with uh, a description of Art Text. This is a screen capture from their About Us page, and I've given a link at the bottom of the screen in case you want to check it out. So Art Text is a library research center and exhibition space for contemporary art. So their unique print and digital document collection holds over 30,000 documents covering the visual arts from 1965 to the present, with an emphasis on the art of Canada and Quebec. And uh, the collection itself is structured with uh, different uh, collections within collections. So they have over 7,500 artist files for Canadian and international artists, as well as 11,000 document documentary files for uh, arts organizations, disciplines, subjects, uh, techniques, things like that. <coughs> As well, uh, they have a wonderful art journal collection, which is um, from the 1960s onwards, and it's uh, international as well as Canadian, and they have a special collections. Uh, since 2002, our text launched a researcher in residence program, and since that time, they've had over or almost 60 research <laughs> residencies. So it's pretty amazing considering it's such a small organization. There's between one and two librarians uh, who work at this organization. So it has evolved over time, but a typical research residency has a duration of between three and six months. Uh, it's often collection-based. Uh, so by that, I mean that uh, the content is often inspired by the collection itself. Uh, our text provides wonderful research support uh, they provide a workspace, some funding, and there is an expectation of some kind of public output. It could be a publication, it could be an exhibition or a talk. It's really uh, what the researcher would like. So for my own research residency, which is Who Was Who Was Who in Contemporary Canadian Art, this was a 2018 uh, spring and summer research residency to explore 
Canadian artists who make use of alternate identities uh, in their art. And there were a number of outputs that were connected to this. Um, the first one was a 2018 interview between myself and an art text librarian, and the interview was posted on the art text uh, blog. There was also a 2020 virtual workshop uh, and information literacy session based on my research, and it was organized and led by the art text librarians. And then finally, uh, there's a 2023 uh, publication. It's um, a bilingual artist biographical dictionary, which is uh, what's circulating right now, who is who is who in contemporary Canadian art. And it's also uh, published Ted Besh, so if you turn it upside down and around, you'll see the French version as well. Qui était qui, qui était qui, dans l'art contemporain canadien. So the publication includes uh, open access texts and images that are licensed to Creative Commons. Uh, there is a print book which is now circulating, and there is an ebook version that is on the way. As well, it's a publication that was uh, co published with Art Text. Here, what we have is a, a, a picture of uh, the maquette. It was a work in progress. And it, uh, on the left hand side, we can see uh, entries either for the artists or for their alternate identities. And on the, right on the right hand side or the facing page, we have uh, two examples. One is by an artist named uh, Robert Phones and a mascot. Uh, alternate identity that he created for himself in the 1970s called Candyman. So Candyman is inspecting London's so-called urban renewal, and this dates from 1972. And it's actually London, Ontario um, as well. On the right-hand side, uh, at the top, it's the artist Robert Dayton, who uh, took a self-portrait as his character, the Canadian Romantic. So that gives you a, an idea of what the publication is like. So I'll just uh, introduce very briefly the concept of our research uh, life cycles. And this is coming from a publication called The No-Nonsense Guide to Research Support and Scholarly Communication by uh, Claire Sewell. The research life cycle is an outline of the steps taken during a research project. Although the exact type and order of stages varies between institutions and individual projects, each example of a life cycle follows broadly the same points, from conception to sharing the final results. The stage is common at any one institution. Determine the support the institution provides to its communities. Uh, as Sewell's uh, text indicates, research life cycles come in many forms, and they are just as much tools for institutions as they are for researchers. So in other words, a researcher can refer to a research life cycle to better understand the stages involved in carrying out research, while institutions can use them to see where and how they can support research. A quick search for a research life cycle uh, on the web and through various library journal databases will uncover hundreds of uh, articles as well as examples of research life cycle models, although it is very challenging to find any models that refer specifically to the visual arts. Uh, in the list uh, for the readings, which is a slide towards the end of my presentation, I've given uh, a couple of examples of excellent life cycles for research data. Um, including one produced by JISC and another one uh, by the Royal College of Art. And I invite you to check those out uh, if you have a chance. Uh, so this is a proposed uh, research life cycle for the visual arts, and I'm hoping it could be used by art researchers, uh, such as art historians, uh, curators, um, art librarians, and other information professionals, as well as artists, visual artists. So it has eight stages, and I'll try and go through each one um, uh, with some notes. So we'll start at the very top, the initial idea or question. So I really do believe that a great idea, uh, a great uh, research starts with an original thought or a question, but often that it's in relation or in reaction to something else. And this is like, uh, I think somebody else mentioned earlier today, the idea of a spark is, uh, is a great way for research to begin. Uh, after that, it's the plan and design stage. Uh, the stage is really for preparatory groundwork. It could include grant writing and possibly a literature review, identifying objectives and goals, defining the project scope. Uh, sorry, it's hard to <laughs> go like this. Identifying research methods and potential collaborators, 
as well as research ethics approval, if uh, applicable. Although uh, it's not listed here, this would also be a stage where visual artists uh, could plan out their space and material requirements, sketch on ideas, etc. So the plan and design stage is followed by explore and create, and this is where research is largely carried out. This could include archival, bibliographic, uh, historic research, etc., writing, and for artists, this could be uh, include experimentation with ideas and materials or general art making. And I've titled the next stage Reflection, Successes and Failures. So at some point, researchers will have to take stock of what they've done so far and whether or not it's working. It includes analyzing their progress with their original objectives and goals, um, perhaps uh, feedback from collaborators or colleagues, and then dealing with setbacks. I haven't seen too many research life cycles that talk about failure and uh, setbacks, but I think these are things that are very real, and so we should, uh, if we can, try and uh, consider them uh, with a research life cycle. So after that, the next stage is output. This stage occurs when the research is made public. So uh, for authors, it could be publishing blogs, articles, book chapters, monographs, etc. And for artists, it could be exhibiting their work, an artist talk, a performance, et cetera. So the effort required to reach this stage is pretty monumental for a lot of people, but it's important for researchers, I think, and for libraries as well, to appreciate that it's really not the end of the research process. So the next stage I've identified is uh, preserve and document. And here the researcher needs to think about how their work will be preserved for the future and how it will be made findable. Uh, so I've given, um, let's see, uh, a number of ideas for authors. It could be uh, adding a publication to a collection, uh, perhaps legal deposit, uh, perhaps self-archiving in their institutional repository, a professional website, or other online resource. Um, at this stage, artists could consider documenting their work and making it available on their website or participating in other online platforms. After preserve and document, it's uh, important to draw attention to the research, and this can include uh, book launches, uh, interviews, uh, and other public activities, uh, submitting a publication for a review or an award, and distribution. For artists, this could include having an opening, exhibition opening, or exhibition closing, uh, exhibition announcements, things like that. And so the final stage is uh, reuse and, and inspire. And this stage is really about uh, sharing one's research. And this can be facilitated by making publications openly accessible, uh, licensing them through Creative Commons, um, and perhaps by having a sustained online presence. And then hopefully, um, sharing your work will inspire other questions or ideas. So we're gonna move on to the third section where I'm gonna try and map uh, the support that I received for my own project with this idea of a research life cycle. So you can see I've kept the same um, structure and what I'll do is try and identify a few points uh, from each one and, and to illustrate how I received uh, support from our text. So under uh, plan and design, uh, it's really the identifying potential collaborators um, as our text collection matched my research topic so well, I applied for a research residency with them and was very happy that it was accepted. It not only brought focus to my work, uh, but it brought external validation for the project uh, in the eyes of my peers. In the stage uh, Explore and Create, I selected um, archival bibliographic historic research, et cetera, uh, because our text really facilitated my research uh, with their excellent reference services. Uh, they also provided me with a workspace, a small storage space, et cetera. So these things really add up in a positive way. From the reflections, successes, and failures, I identified feedback from collaborators or colleagues. At uh, one point, I decided to expand the scope of my project uh, to have it um, copy edited as well as translated into French. I also thought it could be really nice to have images uh, from the artists that were openly accessible. Um, oops, 
Yes. So uh, with all of these changes, I, need, I knew I needed some help. So what I did was I prepared a publication prospectus and I proposed it to our text and they said yes. So I was very fortunate about that. Uh, they convinced me to go with a book designer rather than trying to come up with a, a model using print on demand, which was my original idea. And they also um, decided uh, they wanted to work with a book designer. So they selected a book designer and they collaborated with the book designer and with myself. Uh, they also communicated with the artists whose work were reproduced, uh, which was super because it's not obvious to acquire openly accessible images uh, by living artists. So I was very happy to have that. And from the um, output stage, uh, I mentioned the publishing blog. So I did mention earlier that they published uh, a blog based on an interview. I thought this interview gave so much nice context to the project that I asked for their permission to reproduce it in the dictionary, uh, which they did. So I was very happy about that. Um, under uh, preserve and document, um, our text uh, will take the publication and add it to their collection. They're going to catalog it, and uh, both the print version and the ebook version in ER Text, which is their online library catalog, and it's also a digital repository for open access. Uh, publications. As well, they're going to look after the legal deposit. And under promote, and under promote, and under promote, <laughs> and that's it. So, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I think I'm frozen. Um, that's okay. Maybe my computer is about to restart. Yay, okay. <laughs> so they've uh, agreed to do a, a book launch in uh, September. Uh, they're going to be submitting the publication review to reviews and distribution, and they're also going to um, uh, distribute it and, and sell it as well. Um, yes, sell it. Um, there we are. And so finally, um, our text agreed to make the publication openly accessible. Uh, they agreed to this uh, Creative Commons license, and they are going to have a, a continued uh, presence for it on their website. Um, there we go. Okay, so it's the final section uh, where I'll just raise, uh, summarize a few key points and then talk about the broader implications. So the research lifecycle presents research as a process uh, comprised of distinct but related uh, stages. Uh, it can help researchers to visualize how their work is carried out and how research continues beyond the output stage. So it can also be a tool for libraries to see where and how they support research. As well, by mapping our text research support for my residency project throughout the entire research lifecycle, I hope that it's indicative of how art libraries can contribute to visual arts research in numerous and invaluable ways. Um, in order to address the possible broader implications of these points, I'll quote from a, a 2016 article by Dan Maxwell, and it's entitled, um, uh, the research life cycle as a strategic roadmap. So the research life cycle is actually a strategic roadmap, a quick way of validating the academic library's journey to strategic relevance and alignment. Research services not yet provided thus become strategic opportunities. In those cases where another department on campus already provides a particular service, the library can develop a strategic partnership. Thus, the research life cycle not only highlights what the library ought to do, what services it ought to offer, but it also offers potential partners. Maxwell sees the research life cycle as a tool for libraries to identify where they currently provide support and where they should provide support in the future. Elsewhere in his article, he argues that in an age of diminishing institutional support, libraries need to show their funders a return on their investment. And what better way to do so than to demonstrate how research support is strategically aligned to the missions of their respective learning institutions. Um, just wrapping up, generally speaking, I think it would be very uh, beneficial for art information professionals, such as ourselves, and the organizations that we work for to be able to situate our own research support work within the research life cycle. Not only to better understand our own contributions to research, but to better communicate the value of our work to the diverse communities we serve. The end, thank you.